welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, it's a fair housing focus, new criminal background check restrictions and challenges with assistance animals. I'm Heather Stone, executive editor of the Habitat Group, which publishes legal compliance resources for landlords and property managers, including New York Apartment Law Insider, that's a monthly newsletter, and the annual guidebook, uh, the New York City Apartment Management Checklist. Um, I'd like to thank Ann Korchek from Spony uh, for inviting us to present to uh, Spony members today. And uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to let everybody know that uh, we will be recording this webinar and uh, sending everyone a link to the recording as well as the slides that we have here uh, within a week. So it uh, might not be tomorrow, but it might be a week from today, hopefully before that. But uh, everybody will be getting uh, the materials. Um, OK. Uh, oh, also, we'll have time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. Uh, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions there. And uh, hopefully, we'll have enough time to get through a bunch of your questions. OK, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Attorney Eileen O'Toole. She is the uh, principal of the law office of Eileen O'Toole. Uh, she concentrates her practice in landlord tenant and rent regulation matters. Uh, she's a frequent writer and lecturer. She's the author of the New York Rent Regulation Checklist, editor of the New York City Apartment Management Checklist, and contributing editor of New York Landlord v. Tenant, a monthly case law digest all published by the Habitat Group. Uh, she's currently preparing the fifth edition of the Rent Regulation Checklist, which will be out this summer. Thank you, Eileen, for presenting today and take it away. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, and thank you, Spony, for inviting us uh, again to, to speak before your members. And um, I have two topics today, they're both um, you know, what we call fair housing topics or discrimination, housing discrimination topics. And the first one I'll talk about is the, the new criminal background check restrictions that the city of New York um, adopted at the beginning, at the end of last year, at the beginning of this year, although they will not go into effect until January 1st of 2025. And then after I talk about that, We'll talk about um, challenges with assistance animals, which um, Heather always tells me pets and assistance animals are a favorite topic among um, their subscribers and people who attend um, uh, the owner organization webinars. Um, okay, so I'll start with the criminal background check restrictions. And first I'll mention, as, as, as many of you may know, there are, there are federal, New York State and New York City human rights laws are, are dis laws that regulate discrimination or prohibit discrimination. And it can be in employment, it can be in housing. Those are two major areas that the discrimination laws apply to. And there can be different specifics for different, um, different things, employment or you know, the sale or rental of housing. And also, um, one of the things is that, uh, and I'll get to the, the list at the end of talking about um, the criminal background check rules, is that New York City has more um, categories of discrimination that's outlawed than New York State does or that the federal government has. And all of the, you know, the state, the city, and the federal government um, tend to add things from time to time to this list. And one of the things, um, you know, New York is not the only city that has enacted this type of provision. And sometimes, actually, these 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 things that become added to the law are. Um, develop over time and sometimes they're actually they start with HUD. HUD will, you know, that has its own public housing that it regulates and has a lot of rules for, um, will pass something that then becomes something that that trickles down to the private sector and to large cities like New York. So um, starting with the 
what the criminal background check restrictions are about. Um, at the beginning of this year, New York City Council adopted what they call the Fair Chance for Housing Act, and it's not going to become effective until January 1st, 2025. The act is part of the New York City human rights law, and it applies to all New York City multiple dwellings. And it creates a new category of exemption from rental discrimination, and it restricts criminal background checks against residential rental applicants. And under the act, um, owners will no longer be allowed to discriminate by barring rentals to individuals who had criminal cases that didn't result in a conviction. Someone might have been arrested for something, but there was no conviction on the case. Um, if someone has a misdemeanor con conviction that's more than three years old, that can't be the basis for not renting an apartment to them. If someone has a felony conviction that's more than five years old, that also cannot be a basis for, um, for not renting an apartment to someone. Um, next page, Heather. And one of the things that survives any of this is um, barring housing or discriminating against individuals who are on sex offense registries. Um, so it doesn't matter, you know, this is kind of separate from what I just said about the, uh, you know, the conviction histories and how far they go back. If someone is on a sex offense registry, um, an owner is allowed to decide not to rent an apartment to them. Um, one of the things that is important with this new law is that if you have someone apply for an apartment, they fill out a rental application, and you have to process the rental application and decide that someone is otherwise acceptable as a tenant before you run the criminal background check on them. Um, and, you know, it may actually or should be in your, if you have rent, written rental applications, um, there should be a portion of that, that where the the applicant agrees to a credit check and a criminal background check, um, you know, when they're making the application. But you can't actually run that background check until the applicant has been otherwise um, found to be acceptable. So, and if you're going to, once you do the criminal background check, if you find something that makes um, your office not want to rent to this individual, um, you have to um, you have to let the ten the prospective tenant know that you're doing that and give them an opportunity res to respond. Um, this act it's consistent with you know what I was just mentioning. There are some HUD public um, policy guidelines now that are similar to this um, criminal background check restrictions. And I've read that um, Los Angeles and New Orleans are two cities that happen to have similar types of um, restrictions in their housing laws now. The next page. Okay, if the criminal background check is, is used, if you get to that point and decide you need to run one, um, you have to disclose that to the prospective tenants and um, and have a procedure in place for you know for how you're using the background check. And after there's the preliminary approval of the lease, and this applies to the sale of housing also. And you, then you have the criminal background check. And if there's something in it that is going to make you pull back from approving the applicant, they they have to be given notice and an opportunity to respond. Um, as I said, the, the act applies to multiple dwellings. It doesn't apply to two family houses. Um, if there are owners or members of the owner's family living in one of the apartments in the two family house, or if you have um, in a small, like two family, you have, you rent out rooms to someone, it doesn't apply to um, subtenants or people that do rent rooms to. In, um, in a two-family house. Okay, next slide, Heather. One of the things that the, um, the law does do, it does provide 
that third parties can't make claims against the owner or landlord if um, they claim they are, have been injured because you failed to do the criminal background check or failed to uh, restrict the housing um, you know, from someone who later did something that harmed them. And uh, um, that there's specifically a carve out. So owners are not responsible under the law for that. Okay, the next slide, well, just what I'll do here is I'll run through the, the text of the law just to kind of uh, help everybody get familiar with it. You know, as I said, it's only, you know, it's April. Um, so this law has not been put into place, has not been tested. Sometimes, you know, with any law, there can be challenges filed. I'm not aware of any um, individuals or groups who have filed challenges to this law at this point. Sometimes things may not become obvious until an, a law starts being um, utilized and that, you know, something in the statute's not clear, something in the statute doesn't cover certain provisions, and then you may sometimes have um, uh, challenges or noise made about uh, those things that can result in um, some kind of litigation or amendments to, you know, to the law. But what we have right now is, um, this is part of the New York City Administrative Code, um, uh, Chapter 8, um, which covers housing di discrimination, right? also discrimination in general. It's the New York City Human Rights Law. So this is prohibiting housing discrimination on the basis of uh, criminal history. Um, and they give you definitions of what a criminal background check is. It's something, um, it, you know, it could be you just asking someone in your office if you have a criminal history um, or, you know, in the application, having them consent to you checking on that and using a, there are companies that do credit checks and criminal background checks that sometimes people utilize for this purpose, um, searching available records and um, otherwise gathering records about anyone's criminal history. Um, there's also then a definition of criminal history. And I think we have to move on to the next slide. Oh, the criminal they told us there what criminal history was. Very simply, an individual's conviction history. Um, mostly for purposes of what you can use, a conviction history and it's a criminal history also includes non-convictions and excludable matters and pending cases. So excludable matters, this means things that you can um, not discriminate on the basis of if there was a criminal action and the person was found innocent um, and you know they got a favorable outcome, that can't be a basis for not renting to them. Um, if it's a youth offender or juvenile delinquency matter, that can't be used as a grounds not to rent to someone. Um, if, the, it was, if it was merely a violation, um, you know, not a misdemeanor or a felony, that can't be a grounds to discriminate against a potential tenant or if it's a sealed conviction. Um, sometimes you have in criminal cases, uh, there's an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal that also is something that can't be used to discriminate against uh, an applicant for. Um, this number three is interesting. I think the disposition of a criminal matter under federal or laws about, that results in a status comparable to what results from an excludable matter under New York law. What that basically means is if the, the um, conviction in question was for something that you would not be convicted of in New York. It's something that you got convicted of in another state, but it's not something that would result in a conviction in New York that can't be used against you in your um, application for housing in New York City. Okay, the next slide. This is just another um, another provision of the law. You know, what is a pending case? There can be an accusation or arrest that hasn't resulted in any um, determination yet or any conviction. So, uh, you know, if something has not resulted um, in a conviction that at this point 
at, you know, if that's what's going on at the point you are are applying for the housing, um, that can't be used against you either. Okay, the next. Okay, this gets to it gets the heart of the matter. What are the reviewable reviewable criminal history items? And this I, I talked about a little bit at the beginning. Um, this says a one a says that you can look at uh, sex offense registry information um, to make a determination um, about whether to rent to someone or not. What you cannot um, look at, or you can look at a misdemeanor conviction that's less than three years old. If it's more than three years old, you can't rely on that to, um, to bar a rental to someone. And if it's a felony conviction um, that's less than five years old, that you can look at um, in making a determination about whether to um, discriminate against a potential tenant on the basis of their, their criminal background. Okay, the next slide. And again, um, kind of restating what was stated earlier, reviewable criminal history can't include sealed convictions and expunged convictions, the, uh, the subject of an executive pardon, the subject of you know, a certificate of relief from disabilities or something that's otherwise been legally nullified or vacated. And again, in a little more detail, they're talking about here convictions in another jurisdiction that wouldn't be something you'd get convicted for in New York. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is um, you know, there have been some states in the US in the past year or so who have um, adopted restrictive abortion laws and um, you know there may be people who are convicted of of um, of not obeying those laws but if it's something if it was for something that wouldn't be something you'd be subject to conviction of in New York it, it can't be held against you on the under the background check restrictions. Okay, next page. Now again, this is something I think over the next few months, um, since we're still a ways off from this law going into effect, um, what you should actually be doing, you probably will see more articles about this in um, um, the Apartment Law Insider, if you subscribe to that, or some other Habitat publications, or other publications, or other city um, websites, there may be more information on, so what is, uh, you know, a criminal background check? How do you do one without uh, discriminating against someone? So, um, you know, do you even continue to do criminal background checks? Um, yes, there's no reason not to. You just have to be careful and uniform in how you apply what the information that, that you get. Um, again, as the, the law states on this, you have to process the application otherwise first to determine if the applicant's a, someone you would rent to, then you can do a criminal background check. Um, in your office, you should set up non-discriminatory guidelines for doing that. And one thing that's a way to do that is if you're going to do criminal background checks, um, they should be done pretty evenly, um, either to everyone who's an applicant or to everyone who specifically has something, um, you know, something that would constitute something that you'd want to check out. Um, but probably the safest thing to do is to, if you're going to do criminal background checks, to do them to, um, you know, with your credit checks to, um, you know, to everyone who applies for an apartment so that um, there would be less chance that there could be an inference that you are targeting certain individuals and um, applying whether to even check on the criminal background in a discriminatory manner. Um, so, you know, don't 
close and also the you know kind of the flip side of that is if someone does have some kind of criminal record um that's within the periods that you can look at it don't impose a black a blanket ban on anyone who has a criminal record um there should be um an examination of what the matter was and whether it's something that's would be considered dangerous in an apartment building or not and it can't be just based on arrests um if the convictions within the past three years or the past five years have been for you know dealing drugs in a residential building um for violent behavior for um um you know maybe you know some kind of financial fraud maybe that you know maybe something maybe not but you have to look at look at the cases um since this is a relatively new criteria for um you know discrimination i you know i haven't seen case law on this that i could tell you about that would give you some more ideas about what are the kind of issues that kind of come up with this but you do you need to on the one hand, apply your policy consistency consistently, and on the other hand, ass assess cases individually. Okay, next slide. The um, I just wanted to back up a little just to uh, remind people you may have had dealings with some of these other grounds for discrimination. This so now this. Um, you know, this conviction or, or arrest record as a, uh, you know, within the, the, the periods we talked about being a uh, creating a protected class of people um, in terms of housing discrimination becomes one of a long list in New York City of grounds um, for, you know, for, for, for protection against discrimination. Um, we're starting on with one page here, but this is not the the end of it. We go on, and uh, the second page here is more more of the grounds for um, you know that are prohibited in housing discrimination laws. Um, and again, New York City has more areas than New York State, and the federal government um, you know covers a lot more grounds. Okay, so. So we're, you know, going kind of looking ahead, where could these things come up if there are complaints? If someone is claiming discrimination under the New York City human rights laws on the basis of, um, you know, an impermissible criminal background check as the reason for why they weren't rented an apartment, um, they can file a complaint with the New York City uh, Human Rights Commission. And at the end of this, um, this portion of the, the slides, I did give you the website links for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. They have some good information. Um, they There's a lot. They have the human rights law text. They have the regulations that come under that. They have another page that shows how complaints are filed and processed before the agency and um, how they can be responded to. So they actually do provide a lot of a lot of information. Um, the other place where any of these grounds for discrimination comes up sometimes is in housing court because the owner may bring an eviction proceeding against the tenant and a tenant may say that, well, I'm being um, discriminated against or retaliated against because I am a member of this protected class and I am being discriminated against. Um, that's one place it could come up. It could also come up in a court action. People don't necessarily have to go to the, the City Human Rights Commission to file a complaint. They can bring a, a complaint in state Supreme Court against an owner. And sometimes you'll have more than one tenant doing that. You'll have people um, joining together to file a class action for discrimination and sometimes um, sometimes it may even be an organization on behalf of certain 
uh, individuals that fall under a certain class if they think there's been a pattern of discrimination by, by an owner. So um, that's kind of down the road for, uh, for criminal background check restrictions. We're at this stage, since it hasn't even gone into effect, working more on how do you set up to, um, to process um, applications um, with, this, with this in mind. Um, and then, yeah, I think we just, I touched on, you know, what's, what's here, the um, human rights law website, I think is a good, um, a good place to look for more information. There are some articles, um, you know, Habitat, in addition to the Apartment Law Insider, also has something called the Fair Housing Coach, which is more about um, public housing. Is that about federal housing, Heather? Uh, or it, federal? It's, it's nationwide, it's federal, um, but it, it goes beyond HUD assisted housing. It's any kind of conventional housing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. but it's a, a, based on the Fair Housing Act, the federal law. So, and, and is our discrimination, housing discrimination topics a big part of that publication? That's exactly, exactly what, what it it's is. about. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll send everyone a, a sample copy of it. See if they're interested. Okay. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I I generally my practice does not generally involve public housing, but sometimes um, with these types of topics, the, the the federal you know what's going on in um, public housing under federal law is often a place a good place to look to get an idea of of what's going on or what you know what may be going on. Um, Okay, so that kind of gives us the overview on the criminal background check um, law that's coming down the pike. And now we go on to assistance animals. And some of this, um, some of this people may have dealt with before. And I'll just kind of give you um, quickly on this one, I'm kind of starting back, you know, before you get to the point of somebody claiming their, their, animal that they have in their apartment is an assistance animal or a service animal. Um, what most people know about is that um, a lot of form leases have a no pets clause altogether, or there are owners who will add a no pets clause altogether to leases. Some don't, some do. Um, there is in New York, what we call the um, the pet law, or the, the I don't know what the, the pet waiver law. The pet law has been around since 1985. I actually remember when it went into effect. And um, the pet law says that if you, as the owner or manager, um, have a no pets clause in your lease, but you have a tenant who has openly, or they, I think the language they I've seen in cases is openly and notoriously um, held out that they have a pet. They haven't hidden it. They take the dog out for walks, um, you know, the supersedes the pet in the apartment when they go in there. Um, and that's happened for at least three months before the owner takes any action against the tenant for violating the no lease, the no pets clause. Um, you've waived it and you cannot evict a tenant on that basis. Um, what otherwise may happen is that you will either get an application from a tenant saying, you know, I'm a disabled person, I need a support animal, an assistance animal, and I'm asking for a waiver of the pets clause, which puts you as the owner in the position of making a decision whether to say yes or say no to that. And if you say no to that, you can end up um, in housing court because you may start a case against the tenant for being in violation of the no pets clause. And the defense is, this is my service animal. I'm entitled to it because I have a disability. And um, you may win or lose that case. So what's probably an important thing to do in the pet cases is to look at um, things before you're down the road of a full-blown conflict with um, with the tenant who has an assistance animal. Um, let me just see on this overview page, anything I haven't touched. One of the things that may be changing, there's been some confusion or um, over does the pet law, you know, let's go back to the, to the no pet clause and the pet law with the waiver. Um, does the pet law apply to co-ops and condos? And there has been case law for a while that said, yes, it applies in condos. But there has been different case law 
and um oh this we can get to the sec the next page on oh. this. <laughs> I'm getting there. I've been back and forth a little here. Um, you know, Manhattan and the Bronx, the first department have had case law that says the pet law waiver law does, does not apply to condos. But the, the second department, the appeals court for Brooklyn, Queens and Staten Island has said it does apply to condominiums. And th this has been since the 90s. You've had this, you know, this uh, cases going in different directions and it never got up to the Court of Appeals to resolve it any differently. But I did um, find out almost by accident recently that there is a bill pending now before the city council to tweak the, the New York City pet law. And one of the things it would do is clarify that all dwelling occupants, condos, co-ops, whoever are protected by the pet you know, waiver law. Um, one of the things I'll mention too is that whether um, generally or, or, or particularly since we're talking about um, assistance animals, you cannot, as if you have rent-stabilized tenants, um, in particular, you cannot charge extra security deposits or fees because someone has a um, an assistance animal or a pet. So that's, um, okay, that's, that's just the background, the pet law, um, that the assistance animal rules come into conflict with a lot of times. Um, so under, fed, this is, you know, the federal, state, and New York City laws require owners not to discriminate against disabled tenants, however, whatever the disability is, and however it may be shown that there is a, a physical or mental disability, and you have to give a quote unquote reasonable accommodation to the tenant with the disability. Um, and a reasonable accommodation could be permitting the tenant to keep a service animal or emotional support animal in the apartment. Um, what's the difference? You know, they're both generally, you know, what I would call assistance animals, what a lot of people call assistance animals. A service animal is the more traditional seeing eye dog. Um, you know, they usually have some kind of training and certification. Um, it's, you know, kind of obvious to anyone um, who uh, comes into contact with them that it is a, a seeing eye or service dog. Um, there may be other kinds of animals. You know, I'm thinking I, there are sometimes, I don't know if they get training or certification. I've seen I've seen films where there are people who are um, physically disabled and confined in wheelchairs and don't have much ability to move, that there are actually uh, monkeys that they use to uh, to do certain tasks for them. You know, open jars and, and you know, pick up things that are dropped. Um, and those kind of animals certainly have some kind of training or certification problem. Um, but in, in what's a little different and a little harder to tell, you know, is it live or is it Memorex sometimes is, you know, an emotional support animal um, that the tenant has a disability and says, I, I need to have this animal for emotional support or else I can't function. Um, you know, I'll be clinically depressed and won't be able to get out of bed if I don't have my pets or maybe, but they don't call them pets. They're the emotional support animals um, to take care of. And um, uh, I have proof of that. Here's a letter from my doctor saying that I need this animal. And that's often the point where there starts to be a disagreement and um, uncertainty about what's, you know, whether it is or isn't. And um, you know what, where uh, where a lot of the conflicts come up. Um, one of the things I'll just mention here, because it's on here, is that you can't apply breed restrictions on emotional support animals. If a tenant says, "I need, uh, you know, I need my pit bull, or I need my Rottweiler, or I need my German Shepherd because they are my emotional. That's my dog who I have as my emotional support animal." Um, you can't say because it's a Rottweiler or a pit bull, you can't have it. Um, and that's a more general thing. You can't discriminate 
um, on the basis of, of dog breeds in, uh, in housing. Um, I think that's why you see more often in leases in recent years, there'll be a size restriction. You know, you can't have a dog that's more than 35 pounds or 25 pounds um, to, uh, to kind of get around that. Um, next page. I mentioned this already, not paying the extra deposit fee. Um, but if, you know, this is a, a, a separate law. If you have, if, if you have, this is for anyone with, uh, you know, if you have a dog, dogs are supposed to be vaccinated. I just saw something, I saw something on the web that said that about 45% of people um, don't get their animals vaccinated or don't want to get their animals vaccinated because oh, they, wow. they think the vaccinations are harmful. You know, that I don't know whether that was fake news or not, but, um, it, you know, it's something I hadn't thought of. I mean, but it's, it's against the law not to vaccinate um, your dog. And uh, you know you can be be fine for that. Um, there's also something now to keep in mind, and I almost forgot about this. I have to remind myself about this when I was preparing for this webinar. Um, in tw about two years ago, um, the city came out with a you know yet another lease rider, uh, a, dis a notice disclosing a tenant's right to reasonable accommodation for persons with disabilities under the New York State human rights law. That applies, everybody is supposed to get this as a lease writer um, in, in apartment buildings. Um, and it's much more general. It has nothing to do with pets per se. It's saying that if you need a reasonable accommodation, you have the right to request it. At the end of the slides here, I have a sample of the form um, that's, uh, that's used. And it doesn't say anything specifically about pets and the way it's written, you may wonder what it even has to do with, with pets or support animals, because it's, it, it talks more about structural, you know, if you need a shower bar in your bathroom to get in and out of the tub, or if you need a, a ramp to get in and out of the building or up and down the stairs, that's a more structural thing. But one of the things I can think of off hands that does come up sometimes is, um, you know, if someone has a service animal, um, you can't say to them, okay, you can have um, that big dog, but you can't take the regular elevator. You have to take, you know, the service elevator or something. Um, you can't do that. That's considered discriminatory. And um, that's something you can't do because you're not giving the disabled person a reasonable accommodation by doing that. Okay. Um, As I, I mentioned, it's this, the discrimination against tenants with disabilities is barred by federal, state, and city law. And um, so you can't refuse to rent an apartment on that basis or to treat a tenant differently during the term of the lease because of the disability. And a landlord has to make a reasonable accommodation for a tenant who needs one because of their disability. Um, and that, what does that mean? That means a change, you have to change your procedures or change the physical space of an apartment to accommodate the, um, the needs of the disabled, the disabled person. Okay, and this is just a list of the five uh, laws to keep in mind. We are more focused here on the city human rights law, partly because we are talking about New York City buildings and partly because the New York City law tends to be more expansive than the other ones. So, um, you know, everything gets covered under city city law. And sometimes people, if there's a dispute, it will come up, people will start, you know, filing complaints. They'll, they'll make a decision often about which venue they're going to, but it can come up in more than one venue. Um, so when you get a request or become aware that someone has an assistance animal that is either going to be their defense if you're trying to evict them, or um, uh, they have made a request to you. There's a number of things you have to, to think about and try to get some information about before you make a decision about what to, what to do. Um, is the tenant or the family member disabled? Um, sometimes it may be obvious that someone is physically disabled. Sometimes someone may say they're disabled and they should be able to present to you some form of 
a, a doctor's letter or medical information if they are claiming that there is a disability. Um, and then, you know, is this assistance animal really an assistance animal or is it is it just a pet? That's that's really the big question in a lot of these cases. And does the tenant need the assistance animal to, you know, use and enjoy the apartment? Um, that can be a little tricky, too, or, or there can be interesting things that, that come up, you know, when there's a question about that. Um, there's also a question of how you have processed a tenant's request to keep the assistance animal. Um, that's something, you know, as I, I mentioned with the, the criminal background check rules, um, you should make sure your procedures are pretty uniform, keep records about um, these things, process any of these kind of requests in a similar fashion so that um, no one can claim that um, or not successfully claim that you, you know, you did something with them that you don't generally do. And then the question, um, which comes up sometimes in cases, can an a, a tenant keep more than one assistance animal? And um, any of these questions, one of the things um, you sometimes need to do if you have if you're up against one of these and you either you know have people in your office who are good at checking these things out or you have an attorney who can help you look at these things is you have to look at the um, court or agency rulings next page please next slide um, <laughs> where where this comes up because that's sometimes where you can get into um, you know, what are we really talking about here? Um, I, I've given you a list of some cases you can look at that just uh, talk about this to some extent. Um, you know, the first one is just is, you know, to emphasize that if there was a finding that the tenant was disabled and an emotional support dog was ne necessary to give them an equal opportunity to use and, and enjoy their apartment within the meaning of the Fair Housing Act and the New York Human Rights Law. Um, this next one, the Washington v. Olatoya, um, this was a case that was thrown back to NYCHA um, to look at again because the tenant was claiming that his dog was a service animal and NYCHA said that the dog was actually a, a direct threat to other people and shouldn't be allowed in the building. So they that case got sent back and that that touches on the issue of nuisance animals and we'll we'll get to that toward the end here. Um, the next one. Oh, this case was interesting and I'm sorry to say that I couldn't find um, what the ultimate outcome was, or I think I do know what the ultimate outcome was. In this case, the landlord sued to evict the tenant who had eight dogs and two cats. And she said they were her service animals and she needed all of them. And she had an attorney even. And um, the owner said, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, grant summary judgment in our favor. This doesn't even need a trial. And the court said, no, we need a trial. The tenant has not proved that she needs all of these animals, but we need to have a trial to see if the tenant um, needs to keep eight dogs and two cats as a reasonable accommodation. And, you know, reading through the case, it, it turns out the, the, the owner had actually proposed a settlement. You can keep the two cats, but keep only three of the dogs, get rid of the five other dogs. <laughs> and the tenant had um, a therapist who testified that she needed all of these dogs because when she sometimes had to um, have one or two of the dogs removed from the apartment on a temporary basis for some reason or other, um, she got more depressed. And if she had all these dogs to take care of, she would be less likely to commit suicide. Um, because this kept her going. Um, now, how what a court would have uh, event ultimately said if this went to trial, I really don't know. Um, and I actually, you know, went back to um, uh, I went back to the the court system to look up the um, the filings on the case after this decision. And it, it, apparently, the the tenant passed away about a year after this court decision. So. That probably meant um, 
you know, that the case was resolved because if the tenant had passed away, um, hopefully the, you know, the animals um, were placed somewhere else and um, she was out of there. So there was no reason to have a trial. But um, that I had actually, uh, you know, when I was first asked to talk about uh, this topic um, here today, I, I actually remembered this. Remembered case. that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember yeah, that yeah. one too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there was another case I wrote, you know, I've been writing the landlord v. tenant um, reporter for a long time and, you know, summarizing the case digest in New York. And I know there is a case in there somewhere and I didn't. I didn't look it up or find it for, for this presentation today. There was someone who had overcrowding pets in her apartment. She had too many uh, too many dogs, and and they were creating a nuisance. And the, the court ruled that she had to get rid of the dogs. But one of the dogs had no paws. Um, you know, whatever was wrong with this dog, it didn't have its front paws. And the court ruled that she could keep that dog because, you know, where was that dog going to go? Uh, so... <laughs> But so I think there is a heading in, in an old issue of LVT called, you know, tenant can keep dog with no paws. Um, but I digress. Anyway, um, just looking ahead to some of these other cases. Yeah, we should like in five minutes, maybe wrap up uh, so we yeah. can take some questions. Yeah, we're getting to we're getting close there. Um, OK. So, you know, you can take a look at some of these other cases. Um, the last one just because it, it it feeds into the last thing I want to talk about. Um, Concourse Green Associates, um, this was interesting. Tenant, uh, this is the next page, I think, Heather. Um, the tenant, landlord sues to evict the tenant for violating the no pets clause. And the tenant claims that, um, you know, it's a it's a it's a, an emotional support dog. She should be entitled to keep the dog uh, to accommodate her her disability. Um, but they decided we have to have a trial on this because they waived the pet law provision, and she was entitled to keep the dog to accommodate her disability. But the dog may be creating a nuisance, so that may be you know uh, another reason that she's going to have to get rid of the dog. So um, I don't know whatever happened uh, at the end of that case either. But um, so the last thing I will talk about with this is that, you know, it's kind of three things you have to consider when there's animals that violate um, the no pets provision. Did you waive it? Is the animal permissible because it's a service or emotional support animal? But even if um, the tenant got to keep an animal because of a waiver or got to keep an animal because it is an emotional support or assistance animal, the animal could still be a nuisance. And if the animal is a nuisance, that trumps everything because that's a whole different category of um, lease violation, uh, committing a nuisance or violating your lease because you have an animal that's causing damage to property, that's um, biting people on occasion or threatening the health and safety of staff or other building or, or occupants, and the owner can be held responsible for that. So, um, you know, that's something you really have to consider when you're not wanting to deal with um, a case like this that's coming up that you may really have to. Um, okay, so further information, I tried to list a number of the laws that are of interest here. Um, as and I, this, uh, these slides will be sent to everyone, so uh, don't feel like you have to furiously take notes. We'll be sending this list out. <laughs> Great. And the notice uh, that I talked about, the reasonable accommodation notice is at the end here. Yeah, okay. we put that here at the end. Okay. Okay. We'll take a look at some of the questions that have come in. Let's start off with... An applicant has an emotional support dog that's a Rottweiler. We verified that the applicant has a disability and a bona fide need for the animal, but our insurance bars us from allowing tenants to have certain dog breeds, including Rottweilers. Is this a justified reason for denying the applicant's animal? The short answer is no, and I'll tell you why, because this is something I didn't um, know this precisely until I started preparing for this. I was aware that 
in New York housing law, you can't um, you can't base a claim that someone has to get rid of a dog on the fact that it's a certain breed. It's a Rottweiler. It's a pit bull. It's a uh, German Shepherd. It's you know it's some kind of dog that can um, be scary and hurt people, um, and is big. So you can't discriminate on the basis of a dog breed. And in 2022, the governor signed a new law that applies that principle to homeowners insurance policies. Um, so, or, or apartment building insurance policies. So if the owner, um, you know, in the past, before this law was passed, you might have had a grounds to say, eh, you know, we can't accept your application to have the Rottweiler because our insurance won't allow us to do that. And we may try to ask them to give you an exception, but they may not do that. Um, your insurance company can't do that now. So if you have something in your insurance that says they're not going to insure if you've got a Rottweiler in the building, you've got to contact the insurance company and tell them, you know, you have someone seeking um, a reasonable accommodation for their emotional support animal. It's a Rottweiler and the policy as it stands is in violation of New York state law. Okay. Um, I have been advised by my attorney that once a tenant provides a letter from a doctor, the case needs to be dropped. Is that letter really the be all and end all of the case? Can a landlord make the case that the doctor gives out these letters for a fee and it isn't based on anything? That is a frequent, um, that may be one of the biggest questions that comes up with this. Um, I think you have to try to look at the facts to the extent you can assess them. Um, the letter, you know, is the letter from someone's actual doctor that they see in New York City that they have ongoing psychotherapy with? Is it from some, um, uh, you know, someone who's registered for this purpose isn't even in New York State and it's a piece of paper that's not really based on anything? Um, you know, I have seen in some of these decisions where someone may have a, a vague or broad statement from a doctor claiming that, um, you know, there is medical reason for it, that that that, that can be questioned. It, it becomes a matter of whether you think there's grounds to question it because of other things and whether you want to go to the time and expense to question it when there is a possibility that you'll lose. I mean, I have a sense that those, those kind of... Um, Oh, letters that you can just get online from, you know, from somebody out of state are probably holding less and less weight as time goes on and more of these cases come up. But, um, you know, again, I mean, the case I just told you about where the, you know, the, the woman had eight dogs and two cats. I mean, she had, I think she had testimony, you know, from, mm -hmm. um, well, it was pre-trial, so it may have just been a, a statement, but she had to have, you know, because they were dealing with the summary judgment motion, there must have been a detailed letter from um, from her doctor. But um, Well, somebody else asks here, um, I have tenants who obtain paperwork for an emotional support animal from the internet. How do I prove this? Blah, blah, blah. But I know that HUD has said that just a certificate that you print off the internet you, you should dig deeper. You should see, is this signed by a doctor that the person has seen regularly? Um, you know, get something directly from the doctor so it's not just a piece of paper from somebody who's, you know, half a country away. Right, right. And, you know, and, and either the doctor or some other people may have to testify on... Um, you know, the tenant's behalf. I mean, there this is something that there could be, you know, it kind of lends itself to discovery. Um, you know, in a housing court case, you don't have an automatic right to discovery, but you might be able to get discovery on this. You know, are are there family members or the tenant themselves or, or this doctor who can testify that um, I know that not having this animal will affect the person's ability to function in their living space. And how is that? This is how I know. This is what I've seen. This is what um, I've observed about this person's, you know, mental state um, or physical state when they have or do not have the animals. Um, okay. And um, yeah. 
you you know you need to make a, a decision based on the facts in every individual case. Okay, a blind tenant who needs a guide dog moved into an apartment next to a tenant who suffers from COPD and allergies that make his condition worse. The neighboring tenant says the dog triggers severe allergies and has asked us to relocate the new tenant. We have no other units available. What should we do? That's a problem because you have, you know, what you don't want to do, um, and this may be, this isn't the first time or the last time such a question comes up uh, because you, you, you know, you don't want to be in the middle of kind of dueling disabilities here, um, which is, is what you have. You have a situation where, um, you know, either tenant, depending on what's going on, could have some kind of claim that they are uh, being discriminated against on the basis of, of a disability. Um, one thing, you know, perhaps you could offer, I, I don't know what the facts are, you know, are, who's, who's a long-term tenant, who isn't, um, who might be interested in a buyout? Is some, you know, would one of these people be interested in a buyout if you are, don't have other apartments in the building? Do you have a network of other building owners where you might be able to uh, offer and, and facilitate a move by one of these tenants to another building in the same area in the same price range? Would there be, you know, how, you know, again, is it live or is it Memorex? Is, is, is the, you know, what's at the root of the problem? Is this, you know, this could be, quite real, you know, there could be um, allergies caused by animal hair or dander um, to someone in an apartment next door, particularly if the person with the dog or animal is not capable of maintaining a certain level of, of cleanliness or, you know, sweeping up dog hair. There may be things that the person, you know, how far you want to get into this or are able to get into this there may be things, um, you know, this sometimes happens with people who smoke in buildings and are creating an, an odor problem. You know, you, you try to talk to them about getting filters in their apartment. Can the person who has the dog have the dog groomed? You know, if it's a service dog, like a German Shepherd, say it is a German Shepherd for a tenant, those are dogs that, that shed um, and have a fair amount of, um, of, of dog hair. Can the dog be groomed in a certain way and the apartment taken care of in a certain way where it will minimize, you know, the, um, the dog hair. Um, is, is there something else going on between these tenants that right. it's not really about the dog hair or the dog, or, you know, maybe the person next door is afraid of dogs. Maybe the person hates the other tenant. Um, it, it's, it's hard to know, but you know, unfortunately, if you, yeah, if you're not able to kind of process the um the matter and and talk to people and see if you can resolve something and um, showing that you've made that effort too will help you in case somebody does get litigious right <laughs> yes because it sounds like if you're not able to do that and if you're not able to move one of them sooner or later one or both of them may be filing complaints Okay, uh, someone's asked a question about uh, the the criminal background checks portion. Um, after approval of a tenant, can you ask the tenant to provide court disposition of criminal charge under guidelines presented? I guess that's you, you find a criminal record and you want you can you ask the applicant then to provide proof that it was dismissed or um. I, hmm. Right, because it's a at the time of the application, it's a pending. Um, oh, maybe it's pending at the time of the application, and you want you you're saying can they provide the information later? Uh, off the top of my head, I am not sure what the proceed the right procedure is um, for that, um, because I think that if I understand the law correctly, you know, if you're making a decision at the time um, the application has been submitted and there are, are no convictions within the past three years or five years, um, 
And, but there's a pending case. I don't know how long you could keep the application open, you know, to wait for the wait for the outcome. Um, I am not sure of the um, the answer to that question. If the if whoever sent you the question has left you, um, uh, you know, an email address, I'll try to look into it. Yeah. Okay. We'll do. Uh, okay, well, I think that uh, brings us up to time. Um, I would like to uh, thank everyone for attending and thank uh, Ann Ch Korchek at Spony and all the Spony members for having us today. Uh, we will be sending out a copy of the slides as well as a link to the recording uh, within a week. Uh, so thank you, Eileen, and thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Okay, thank you, Heather, and thank you, Spony people. Bye. Bye.